our next lecture, and this will be the final lecture for this semester, brings us back to developments in Europe uh, towards the end of the Roman Empire, where we're going to see a kind of split uh, in terms of what's happening in the western part of the empire, and then by extension Western Europe uh, and East Europe. Uh, but before that happened, right, the empire, uh, we're going to kind of begin where the empire is still uh, pretty much still in pretty good shape, uh, but it was starting to run into problems. And uh, if we're talking about this kind of division, it probably, the story begins with the emperor Diocletian, who governed between 284 and 305. And, you know, at some point it's decided that the empire had become somewhat unwieldy to, to somehow manage. And so it created a new administrative system, dividing it into two halves, an east half and a west half. Uh, and each half would then consist, uh, would be further divided into two prefectures, four in total, uh, with each prefecture then being divided into three dioceses. Uh, 12 in total, that would be headed by a, a vicar. Uh, and the idea is that, uh, in a sense, it would represent a kind of decentralization of authority, uh, certainly with respect to, to the two halves, the East and Western halves, which would, uh, in some ways, kind of govern themselves independently of one another. And we can see here kind of a map illustrating uh, how uh, territorially the empire was divided. Uh, so you have an Augustus that would be in charge of each, each half, a, uh, a Caesar, the title they used was Caesar, responsible for uh, each of the prefectures, and then the vicars who would be in charge of the diocese. Uh, and by the way, some of you might recognize that term diocese. Uh, it's a kind of administrative uh, term in terms of territorial division that uh, later on will be adopted by the Catholic Church and is still used by them, right? So uh, within the Catholic Church, often you refer to diocese as falling under the authority of a particular bishop. Uh, and that was actually borrowed from this administrative structure from the Roman Empire. And related to this, like what other, other institutions of government had still kind of carried on from the earlier times, are, are really being uh, stripped of any real power. And this is certainly true of the Roman Senate, uh, which by the time of Constantine has really become little more than a kind of city council of Rome. Uh, so, you know, it has uh, some authority within Rome, but it's kind of like a municipal government with no real power with respect to the rest of the empire. And in fact, emperors are developing uh, entirely new administrative bureaucracies uh, and at some point, they kind of divide it into two separate bureaucracies, one responsible for civil matters, you know, kind of governing the empire internally, and then another responsible for military affairs, right? So you have a civil and military bureaucracy uh, where their responsibilities really become separated from one another. And you also see the development of a kind of hierarchy that really, you know, kind of reflects how close you are to the emperor, right? So they develop new titles of nobility, such as uh, illustrious or illustrious ones, and then at the very top, those who are kind of highest up in the bureaucracy, uh, and in that sense, uh, dealing much more directly and having much more of a connection with the emperor, the illustrissimi, uh, the most illustrious ones. Uh, in the meantime, the army has been enlarged to about 400,000 men, uh, but that's going to prove problematic because in order to do that, they're increasingly having to recruit uh, from their point of view, barbarians, mostly of German, uh, Germanic origin, and you're starting to see a lot of Germanic tribes migrating into Europe. By Germanic, we mean people speaking various uh, dialects of what today we call German, uh, German, right, the German language. Uh, but going by many different uh, names, very often reflective of what tribe they came from. Uh, the problem with this is, Throughout its history, uh, it, it's not that it was an entirely new thing to be recruiting uh, barbarians, i.e. people who were coming from outside the empire, but it used to happen on a much more individual basis, and the idea is that these individuals then would have been dispersed throughout the army, throughout various units and legions, uh, and would effectively have been Romanized. They're now being brought in uh, uh, almost at the tribal level, like entire tribes being brought in, uh, and kept separate from the Roman element within the army. Uh, so these individuals are kind of maintaining uh, their German identity. They never really 
feel connected to the empire. Uh, very often they're operating on, you know, kind of more as mercenaries, so they're being paid. So in other words, uh, if at some point they decide it would be, uh, you know, more profitable to turn on the empire, they're very likely to do so. Another development during this period is you're starting to see, in some sense, the foundation for feudalism being laid. Uh, so, uh, economically, things are starting to fall apart. Uh, agricultural conditions are becoming depressed, so smaller farmers are increasingly losing their farms. Uh, very often, these farms are being gobbled up by large landowners. So, you end up with fewer and fewer really large landed estates, right? Fewer farms, but all of them much bigger. And the farmers who end up being thrown off the land, who end up losing their farms, end up working for these large landowners as tenant farmers, right? Uh, the term they use is colony. Uh, and, you know, towns are also tending to decline. So you have these large landed estates that are becoming isolated from one another and in many ways self-sufficient, right? So there's kind of a, a, a diminishing of interaction between different areas. Uh, and so these colony become very much dependent on the large landowners uh, pretty much for all their needs, even as they're you know, kind of part of the system providing that, but also for, for their defense, right? And at some point, uh, this kind of development is also seeing a kind of uh, depletion of agricultural supply for the empire. Um, and so it becomes really important from the point of view of the empire to guarantee that large landowners have an adequate supply of labor in order to maintain the food supply. So we start to see edicts being issued that literally uh, bind the colony to the land, right? And what, what we mean by that is, I mean, they're not slaves, they're not owned by the landowners, but at some point they are not permitted to leave without his permission, right? And that becomes uh, one of the uh, most important elements of feudalism when we enter the Middle Ages. Well, under Constantine, we're also going to have a new capital. Uh, so increasingly, it's considered important that the, uh, that the government should be able to focus on developments in the East. Even though you have all these Germanic tribes that are constantly threatening Rome on its border, uh, the Roman Empire on its border, uh, you know, pretty much in what today we call Western Europe, uh, the perception is that the, the chief enemy, the main enemy of the Roman Empire, is the Persian Empire, right? And so they kind of want to make sure that the administrative center, while it shouldn't be on the frontier where it might be uh, in danger of being attacked, uh, it should be closer to where, uh, you know, where it needs to have its attention focused. And so at some point, Constantine builds a new capital uh, on the site of the Greek city of Byzantium, much further to the east than Rome. This will happen between 324 and 330. Uh, and of course, this is the present day uh, city of Istanbul. Uh, at that time though, taking its name from Constantine, uh, Constantinople. And again, the, lo the location chosen for strategic reasons, uh, first the fact that it should be located to the east, but also they choose an area of land that is surrounded by water on three sides and very easily defended. Uh, and this will end up becoming kind of the political, economic, and cultural center of the empire. Now, Constantine is probably most famous for uh, the fact that he converted to Christianity. Uh, and, but we should be careful about that, right? So, I mean, he, he does play a major role in eventually uh, facilitating the spread of the Christian faith within the Roman Empire. And his support for Christianity actually began... Uh, well before he himself converted. Uh, according to the tradition, in 312, just before a major battle, he had a vision of a Christian cross, right? And he took that as a symbol that uh, if he supported the faith uh, related to this symbol, i.e. Christianity, he would be victorious. And in fact, he won the battle. And from that point on, he became very supportive of this faith, which, which had actually been propagating in the Roman Empire for some time, but very often... Uh, had been heavily frowned upon by emperors. There were periods where uh, Christians had been persecuted and so forth. So in 313, he issues the Edict of Milan. Uh, but it doesn't make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And that's something people often mistakenly believe. Uh, what it did permit uh, was it, it, it basically made it safe and easy to be a Christian. It officially tolerated the existence of Christianity. 
Uh, and he, he himself was not actually baptized, uh, you know, i.e. became fully a Christian until just before his death. Uh, so with Constantine, Christianity basically becomes sanctioned, but it, it's hardly the case that you have to be a Christian. Having said that, Constantine is going to do much to promote the Christian faith, uh, most notably through the building of churches, uh, certainly in Rome and in Constantinople, uh, but in some ways even more importantly, uh, and some of this is going to be kind of through uh, his mother, uh, who also becomes Christian and, and becomes very active in promoting the faith, uh, and later on will be, uh, will be made a saint, she'll be canonized by the church, uh, Saint uh, Helena, uh, but she at some point travels to uh, Palestine, right, where Jesus had once lived and where, you know, uh, all the stories that you find in the Bible had taken place. And she was really mu very much interested in identifying the location, the actual location of different stories in the Bible. Uh, for instance, the site of where Jesus had been crucified uh, and buried and then later had risen from the grave, right, according to the Christian tradition. And by this time, there, there were definitely uh, very firmly held beliefs about where these locations were, uh, you know, whether in fact uh, these events took place in these locations or even whether they happened at all. You know, that's something historians might debate, but, you know, certainly among those who believed in Christ, uh, there, were, there were pretty strong ideas about where these things had happened. And so she uh, then promoted the building of churches to kind of commemorate these very important events. Probably the most famous would be the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, uh, built in Jerusalem to mark the site where Jesus had been crucified and buried. And even until today, a very important site of pilgrimage uh, for Christians. Right? This is the church as it looks today. Uh, actually, not much of the original uh, you know, Byzantine structure remains, right? The Eastern Roman Empire eventually being uh, referred to as the Byzantine Empire. Uh, the church was destroyed a number of times and then rebuilt. Uh, and much of what you see here actually dates back to the time of the Crusades. Uh, very interesting story, though, in terms of how did she... Uh, she also wanted to find the original cross that Jesus was crucified on. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, at this site, uh, they did find a cistern, kind of a, a well carved into the stone, uh, where they found deposited many, many crosses, right? So it does appear that this was a place where crucifixion happened. Uh, the question then was how to determine which of these crosses had actually belonged to Jesus. And according to the legend, what they did is they, they brought out a corpse, a dead man, laid him out, and then one after the other, they laid the crosses next to him. And they knew they had found the real cross, the true cross of Christ, uh, when this man rose from the dead. That's a tradition. I'm not saying that actually happened, right? But that's the story. Um, and of course, today, uh, there are many chur churches that claim to have a bit of wood that belonged to the true cross. Uh, but again, this is more a matter of faith uh, than historical fact. Uh, she also located the supposed site of Jesus' birth in the small uh, town of Bethlehem, which is about 20 to 25 minutes from Jerusalem. Uh, and there they had built the Church of the Nativity. Uh, this, what you see here in this image here, is actually pretty much the original Byzantine structure going back to its origin. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see that. Uh, and, you know, just by way of interest, uh, if you're a Catholic or an Orthodox Christian, very often they have major celebrations uh, at Christmas time commemorating, uh, commemorating Jesus' birth. I actually had the, the privilege of twice attending this service, uh, the Midnight Mass, as they call it, uh, being run by uh, the Catholic Church. In any event, the guy who actually makes Christianity the official religion of Rome uh, is Theodosius the Great. And what that means is at that point it became the state religion and it's no longer simply a matter that they tolerate Christians, you absolutely must be a Christian. Uh, if you're a pagan, you're going to be persecuted. And later on there will be great concern that you have proper Christian beliefs. So you might claim to be a Christian, but have beliefs that are not sanctioned by the 
uh, the church and the state, and then you're going to have a problem. Uh, but certainly the, the first target of this will be pagan, right? So Christian leaders now are going to have tremendous influence at the governmental level, and eventually pagan religious practices will be outlawed. So by the fourth century, uh, the church has become pretty well established throughout the Roman Empire and is beginning to develop its own hierarchy and organization, very much borrowed, uh, especially territorially, from Roman administration, right? So you have a, a system where each city, each major city will be headed by a bishop, and his jurisdiction will be known as a bishopric or diocese. The bishops, in turn, uh, will come under the authority of a smaller number of archbishops who have authority over uh, specific provinces. Uh, and the archbishops, there are four of them, corresponding to what are considered to be the four greatest cities within the Roman Empire. Uh, great, in this case, to some degree corresponding uh, to whether they played an important role in the early development of Christianity. So these four great cities are Rome, Jerusalem, Alexandria in Egypt, and Antioch in what today is Syria. All four are considered to be, uh, you know, the bishoprics are considered to have been founded by the original apostles of Jesus, and as such, uh, you know, have kind of special positions of power, right? So, for instance, the bishopric in Rome uh, is held to have been founded by uh, Peter, right? Uh, and Peter, uh, you know, supposedly had actually, according to the tradition, had been a, a follower of Jesus, had known him personally, uh, and eventually had traveled to Rome, uh, where he helped to spread the faith, where he was persecuted and crucified. So, uh, as often happens as a religion develops, uh, particularly as it gains kind of political power, uh, you start to see a concern with whether people have correct belief. Uh, and this is not unique to Christianity. All religions uh, in their origin, uh, at some point, you know, there are different beliefs that are starting to float around, many of which are contradictory. Uh, and at some point, the authorities in that religion have to decide which beliefs are correct and which ones are not. Uh, so uh, what are considered to be incorrect beliefs are referred to as heresies. Right? The definition of a heresy, a teaching different from the official Catholic or universal beliefs of the church. And the term Catholic actually means universal, right? The idea that this church uh, should, in, in some sense, be monolithic, should be consistent with respect to all believers. believers. Uh, and early on, there were like a certain number of very specific issues uh, that really proved controversial uh, and, and led to a really tremendous concern about, you know, correct belief, right? So uh, probably the most important question uh, over which people were divided concerned the nature of Jesus, whether he was human, whether he was divine, or some combination of both. Uh, and we should know that very often the position taken might also have reflected kind of political struggles, right? For instance, uh, it could reflect that a church is trying to assert its independence uh, from uh, a higher authority within the hierarchy. So the first major heresy uh, came to be known as Arianism because it was initially promoted by a priest from Alexandria in Egypt named Arius, who argued that Jesus was human and thus not truly God. Uh, and this went, went against what by this point had actually become kind of the mainstream belief. The individual who really kind of confronted him on this was the Bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, who argued that Jesus was both human and God. And this was all happening uh, during the time when Constantine was emperor, and he was gravely concerned about this. Right? Uh, there was really kind of, you know, growing recognition of the importance of the church with respect to political power. And it's very important from the point of view of Constantine that all his subjects had the same basic beliefs. And also as a believer, he probably sincerely was concerned that people should believe the right thing. In any event, uh, in order to deal with this controversy, he organized a council of all the important religious leaders that was held in the town of Nicaea, in what is present-day Turkey, in 325. Uh, to address this claim by Arius. 
And in the end, the council condemned Arianism. Uh, and this is where we, we really see kind of a formal statement of uh, what we often refer to as a creed, right? The idea that by virtue of being a member of this faith, there are certain things that you just take as an article of faith. You just simply believe. Uh, and in this case, the creed is that Jesus is of the same substance as God. And hence we get the Nicene Creed, right? Which uh, if any of you have ever intended, uh, attended a church service, particularly a Catholic one, uh, but also a Protestant church service, uh, at some point you might have recited this creed, right? It's kind of a statement of belief. And this is, in, you know, in principle, what defines you as being a Christian. Uh, the first point, we believe in one God, the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. So this is a statement of monotheism, right? But uh, we also believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before, before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father. Uh, and the point here too, they were, you know, so they're first establishing that Jesus is both human and divine, uh, and Son of God, but also God incarnate. Uh, this also becomes a bit problematic because it does seem to challenge the kind of oneness of God, right? The idea of monotheism, that there is only one God, and suddenly it kind of sounds like there are two, maybe even three if we count the Holy Ghost. Um, so they're really stressing that Jesus was not created in a moment, that before a particular time, before his birth, he didn't exist, and then at some point he did. Uh, it's the idea that, that Jesus is eternally existing alongside the Father. Uh, so they never say that he was like created by God, that he is begotten. You know, and then kind of really stressing the, the fact that there is this kind of overlap, light of light, very God of very God, and so forth. So anyway, this becomes kind of a defining uh, aspect of the Christian faith. Uh, and there will be other uh, heresies to come where church leaders will come together to try and decide what the right position is. Uh, I should note that the, uh, the Council of Nicaea also makes a determination on which Gospels uh, are canon, right? Uh, and so the Gospels in the, in the Bible, there are four of them. The, the term Gospel literally meaning the good news, but they're essentially biographies of the life of Jesus. Uh, and four are deemed to be, and there, there were many more than four, right? But they, you know, many of them seem to contradict one another. Uh, you know, some of them you just couldn't have this one and that one uh, because they, they just said entirely different things. Uh, and so these were the four that the church decided were in fact divinely sanctioned, uh, that reflected God's will uh, and the truth of, of the story of Jesus and the others would end up being rejected. After Constantine, the empire again is divided into an eastern and western half, and from that point forward, uh, that division will remain pretty permanent. Uh, this is uh, 395. Uh, by 395, they're just you know completely two separate empires that are going their own way. Uh, in the western part of, em of the empire, uh, well, it's becoming weaker and smaller, and a lot of this reflects these kind of uh, waves of German uh, uh, Germanic tribes that are, are migrating into Europe. And so what's happening is like some of them come in, they stop at the border of the empire, but then others come behind them, put pressure on them, and force the earlier ones to spill over into the empire. And you're going to start seeing them moving across various parts of the empire. Uh, and increasingly, the Romans are really unable to do anything to prevent them moving around, settling in different places, uh, you know, maybe trying to at least create a fiction that they recognize the authority of Rome, but they're pretty much acting independently, uh, and at some point, even foregoing that. Uh, and you really understand that things are getting dicey when Rome itself is coming under attack. The first major time that happens is under Attila the Hun, uh, who is turned back by Pope Gregory the Great. Uh, so they don't actually invade the city. And according to the, uh, the Christian tradition, like the angels had actually played a role, they, they descended and somehow persuaded Attila and his forces to turn back. 
this is the first time we've seen the term Pope, uh, the term Pope referring to the Archbishop of Rome, who with the decline of Roman political authority, it, the church is starting to kind of fill that vacuum and take on a kind of uh, role of political leadership, right? So he's kind of actually the guy who comes out there uh, to represent Rome uh, with respect to Attila the Hun. They wouldn't pro prove so lucky 15 years later. Uh, and really, you know, even in 395, uh, there were many at the time who kind of recognized that it was only a matter of time before Rome went down. Uh, Germanic tribes are now passing freely through the Roman Empire, settling down in places, uh, and Roman forces increasingly for forced to withdraw from the frontier. And at some point, really, you know, the only territory under the direct authority of the Roman uh, emperor uh, is, you know, a very small amount of areas, maybe kind of a center, northern part of modern day Italy, a little bit, you know, what corresponds to southern France. Um, so emperors had very little power and increasingly very difficult uh, to defend the city. In 410, Rome itself was actually sacked, you know, meaning that uh, Germanic tribes kind of came into the city, raping, pillaging, uh, something equivalent to what you see in an episode of Game of Thrones, I suppose. It's kind of hard to say, you know, that there is an official date on which the empire uh, ends in the West, uh, but, but you you know, historians have actually come up with a date, you know, kind of corresponds to when, you know, the last emperor goes down and there are no more emperors after that. Uh, even before that, at some point, the emperors had no real power. Uh, for a brief period of time, you had a position known as the masters of soldiers, where the real power laid. Um, and again, by this point, the Roman Empire pretty much only corresponding to some parts of Italy, a small part of Gaul, again, you know, roughly what is France today. Uh, and then in 476, uh, a master of the soldiers named Odasir deposed the last Roman emperor. So some historians have kind of cited this, uh, this date, 476, is marking the end of the Roman Empire. Though, of course, the eastern part would carry on, uh, though eventually kind of developing its own kind of civilization that we often, you know, we start to refer to it not as the Roman Empire, uh, but as the Byzantine Empire a reference to the uh, city of Byzantium upon which Constantinople, uh, Constantinople was built. Uh, and so what had corresponded to the Western Roman Empire very quickly divided up between various Germanic tribes as illustrated on this map. Right? So again, the Eastern side, we see you know, the Eastern Empire eventually known as the Byzantine Empire is carrying on. Uh, and then we see different uh, Germanic tribes settling in different parts of Europe. Uh, we have the, uh, in this map, we still have a little bit of the uh, Western Roman Empire carrying on, but you have the Franks, for instance, in what will become France. And in fact, France takes its name from them. The kingdom of the Visigoths in parts of France and Spain, uh, and various other tribes like Angles uh, and Jutz, and Frisians, which by the way is where my name comes from, settling in different parts of Europe and Britain. You might look a little bit more closely at some of these Germanic tribes, right? Again, very often taking different names. Um, and what's kind of interesting, as different tribes moved into different parts of the former Roman Empire, uh, very often they would begin to intermingle with whatever remained of the Roman population there. Uh, and very often this would kind of create something new, but in different ways, depending on which German tribe, uh, Germanic tribe had actually settled there. So in kind of in some ways, we're starting to see the emergence of uh, divisions that correspond to the modern states of Europe. Um, so one uh, Germanic kingdom, one of the earliest and uh, quite interesting one that we might consider was the Ostrogothic kingdom of Italy. And this came about when Zeno, the emperor in Constantinople, uh, decided uh, that with the uh, deposing of the last emperor in Rome that he would try to conquer Italy and bring it kind of back into the Roman fold. Uh, so he basically hired a, a, an entire Germanic tribe to do this on, uh, on behalf of the Eastern Empire, uh, the Ostrogoths, and the idea is they should go into Italy, remove Odasser, conquer Italy, and then kind of turn it over to the Eastern Empire. 
the head of the Ostrogoths, their tribal chief, if you will, was a fellow named Theodoric. And, and so they did this, but then he kind of decided, well, you know, why not keep it? And so basically established himself there as ruler in 493. Now, the Ostrogothic kingdom is actually going to prove relatively short-lived. It really doesn't outlast Theodoric, uh, who reigns from 493 to 526. But what's really interesting here is, you know, there's this kind of conscious attempt to create a synthesis of Ostrogothic and Roman practices. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Ostrogoths are still going to try and maintain a sense of their separate identity. Right? So he maintains the basic structure of Roman imperial government, but does establish separate systems of rules uh, for Ostrogoths and Romans, right? that they would be kind of governed in a different way. Uh, and, and there is this kind of hope that eventually they, they might come together to forge a new people. Uh, the thing that kind of gets in the way is, the, is they, they have like differences in religious belief. The Ostrogoths are Aryan Christians. They kind of uh, believed in this, uh, you know, Arian heresy concerning the nature of Jesus. Uh, the vast majority of, of the population that, that was in place when they got there, uh, they, they were more part of the mainstream, uh, certainly what today constitutes the mainstream regarding, you know, that Jesus is both divine and human. Uh, so this ended up being kind of an obstacle to their coming together. And shortly after Theodoric's death, the Eastern Roman Empire reconquered Italy, and was actually able to hold on to it for a few years, from 535 to 552. Uh, but then they got hit by the plague, their military was greatly weakened, they had to deal with uh, conflict in other parts of the Eastern Empire. And in 568, the Lombards, another German tribe, conquered much of northern and central Italy. And by the way, the name of the, the region in northern Italy today is Lombardy, taking its name from this Germanic tribe. Another Germanic tribe we might consider are the Visigoths, who established a kingdom in Spain. Uh, and, you know, again, they had to deal with this kind of, you know, how do you interact with the existing Roman population that they found there? Uh, and so there is an attempt to, you know, kind of make it work out, to find a way to coexist. Uh, one obstacle the Visigoths didn't have to deal with, they shared the same version of Christianity. Uh, what uh, very often today we refer to as Latin Catholic Christianity. Uh, and so this also facilitated intermarriage. So we start to see kind of the creation of a new political elite, uh, you know, kind of the, the uh, people who were already in a higher position when they got there with kind of uh, the upper elite among the Visigoths. Uh, and so there is kind of a, to some degree, a fusion of the two peoples. Uh, the problem there was something different. They didn't really have a good system of choosing the next ruler, right? Uh, so there's no hereditary monarchy where, like, you know, after the king dies, it goes to the next male heir. Uh, basically, you know, the, the more important members uh, of the political elite would fight it out in order to choose a new ruler, and this could be very disruptive. Uh, and then, eventually, they fell in 711 to Muslim invaders, and we've already talked about how with the advent of Islam, this new Islamic civilization is going to create an empire spreading from Spain, uh, Spain in the uh, west, all the way to the borders of China in the east. And here we see kind of, uh, on the one hand, uh, would, would appear to be a depiction of a struggle for uh, choosing the, the next king, the successor to the throne, uh, and on the other side, we see a map of the kingdom of the Visigoths at its greatest extent. Probably the most important Germanic kingdom was the Frankish one. Uh, and again, the, the, the present day name of France takes its name from the Frankish kingdom. This was established by Clovis, who became a Catholic Christian around 500. Uh, and uh, I think he kind of recognized the political utility in doing this. By this time, the Roman Catholic Church is becoming pretty powerful, particularly the archbishop who's starting to refer to himself as Pope uh, in Rome. And so converting to Catholicism is going to gain you the support of the Roman Catholic Church, which has tremendous influence among uh, the population there. Uh, and of course, as goes the king, so goes all of the Franks, right? So the Germanic people who came with him also convert 
uh, as well. And so they will establish a pretty powerful Frankish kingdom in roughly what corresponds to modern day France and parts of West Germany. Uh, and so very often this uh, first dynasty referred to as the Merovingian dynasty, supposedly taking its name from some semi-legendary semi ancestor named Merovich. Uh, for those of you who are fans of uh, the Matrix films, you might remember there is a French character that they refer to as a Merovingian. Why, I have no idea, uh, but perhaps it is a, you know, maybe the, the writers just felt this was a cool name. Now, they did have one problem, uh, which is going to kind of prevent them from, you know, fully getting off the ground right at the start, uh, which is that uh, by their tradition, when the king dies, his kingdom is, is supposed to be divided between all of his sons. Uh, and you can see where, how after a few generations, that might be a problem. You're just going to have an increasingly large number of smaller kingdoms. In this case, it ends up being divided into three major areas. Uh, but they did establish kind of the foundation of uh, a new culture, uh, kind of the beginnings of a new civilization, right? A ruling class emerges, uh, which really does reflect a fusion uh, between political elites of both the existing Roman population and the Franks, right? So uh, you have kind of the old Gallo-Roman senatorial class from the Roman period that are intermarrying with kind of the... Uh, higher ranking warriors of the, of the Franks to create a new nobility. Uh, from an economic standpoint, one problem is that the Franks uh, pretty much do nothing to encourage commerce and trade. Uh, so, you know, by 750, uh, it's pretty much a, an agricultural state centered around the old Roman latifundia system, right? These very large landed estates. So we can also see this as kind of furthering the development of feudalism. Right, where, you know, again, you, you don't have much in the way of towns, you just have a lot of these very large landed estates that to some extent are self-sufficient and have very limited interaction with one another. Well, in some ways, fortunately for the Franks, uh, you know, we talked about how with each generation you had this uh, potential where the kingdoms would just become further and further divided. Uh, but before that could happen, uh, one individual is going to reunite them, a fellow named Charles Martel, uh, who originally had served as the major domus, a high-ranking palace official, uh, but was able to bring all three Merovingian kingdoms kind of back together under his rule by 741. Uh, and part of this reflected that uh, he kind of uh, rose to prominence in connection with a very major battle, the Battle of Poitiers in 722, uh, which turned back the Muslim expansion, right? That was at some point threatening to move north uh, further into Europe. Uh, so in some ways also kind of establishing the frontier between these two different civilizations, right? This kind of developing Islamic one uh, that ran you know, right up to the northern border of Spain uh, and what was happening in the rest of Europe. And concerning the rest of Europe, we should note, in the meantime, other Germanic tribes are migrating to different parts. Uh, Britain, for instance, had been abandoned by the Roman armies by the beginning of the 5th century, uh, partly because they were being attacked by Germanic tribes, but you know, also they had to kind of withdraw to defend other parts of the empire. Uh, probably the two most important Germanic tribes with respect to England are the Angles and Saxons, who came from northern Germany and Denmark, uh, and particularly after the Romans left, really began to, began to settle there on a much larger scale. Uh, by the way, I mean, the term Anglo-Saxon, uh, often referring to people from England, is a, a reference to these two Germanic tribes. In fact, the name England itself uh, corresponds to the Angles. Uh, the native population, which was Celtic, uh, would be pushed uh, kind of back to the margins, pushed back to Cornwall, Wales, Cumberland, uh, and also kind of confined to what today is Scotland, right? And these are all considered to be Celtic people, kind of a reference to a uh, family of languages. And here we see uh, eventually the emergence of a number of different kingdoms, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, uh, in what today is England. Somewhere down the road, they will eventually become united. 
uh, but that'll take some time. And uh, on the left, you see kind of, uh, you know, if you were to visit what had been, you know, maybe the archaeological site corresponding to an early Anglo-Saxon settlement and attempt to kind of reconstruct what that might have looked like. Just by way of fun fact, some of you are probably familiar with the legend of King Arthur. Uh, some historians, you know, have, have speculated, and this really is speculation, we have really no, you know, really solid evidence to base this on, uh, that that legend might correspond to kind of a last ditch attempt by the Celtic people uh, to hold out against these Germanic tribes. That King Arthur maybe was even some kind of Roman general uh, who was trying to defend the uh, native Celtic population uh, against uh, these invading forces. So there are some commonalities with respect to all these Germanic tribes that are, you know, going to shape this kind of new developing European civilization, regardless of what place we're talking about, right? So uh, certainly some aspects of Roman civilization are going to carry over, right? But the Germanic tribes are going to bring something to the table as well. Uh, for instance, uh, the manner in which kingship develops uh, as we enter later on into the Middle Ages reflects kind of more the Germanic conception of that. Uh, there are also some, you know, kind of ideas about the law uh, that, you know, are very different uh, as conceived by uh, the Germanic tribes, right? So uh, we had that article by Palmer on the development of Roman law. One aspect of that is like, you know, in the Roman Empire, if you committed a crime, it wasn't really... Uh, considered to be an offense against a particular person. It was an offense against society or the state. Uh, and that's why, for instance, today, if you commit a crime, right, uh, the prosecution is carried out by the district attorney who represents the state, right? Um, and, you know, related to that is the idea that, uh, you know, it's really not, it shouldn't be about vengeance uh, or revenge. It should be about justice. Uh, Germanic law you know, they're like, no, it's really about vengeance, right? Tended to be more personal. Uh, and much as we saw with the Arab tribes looking at the early history of Islam, crimes uh, often led to blood feuds between the different Germanic clans and tribes. And to prevent this, they had to come up with a way uh, of, you know, satisfying this kind of need for vengeance, right? Uh, one way they came up with, uh, de for dealing with this was what they call the vergent. Uh, Vergel, literally uh, meaning kind of man, money. The word in German today, Geld, uh, means money. Uh, so, you know, the idea is that uh, the wrongdoer could pay a fine to the person or the family who had been wronged, uh, the Vergel, uh, and that would absolve the need for vengeance, right? That would prevent a blood feud. Uh, and they even kind of worked out, like, the value of different people, depending on whether male, female, age, uh, you know, what, what their social status was, uh, this would determine what the amount should be of the vergo. Uh, so, for instance, a young woman might, in some cases, be considered more valuable than uh, an older man, uh, mostly because if, if she were killed, uh, that means you also killed, uh, you know, you kind of killed off her potential to create children and so forth. There was still the, uh, the problem of determining innocence or guilt. So as you might remember, according to Roman law, there is, first of all, presumption of innocence until proven guilty. The idea that you, could, uh, that you should argue your case based on evidence, construct a rational argument and so forth in order to demonstrate innocence or guilt. German uh, law worked different, differently, right? German customary law. Uh, so first of all, there tended to be kind of more of an assumption of guilt. It was almost as if you were accused, it was kind of uh, incumbent upon you to demonstrate that you couldn't have done it. Uh, and there were two ways to kind of determine innocence or guilt according to German customary law. On the one hand, you have compurgation, uh, the swearing of an oath backed up by a group of oath helpers, uh, effectively an alibi, right? That you claim, uh, you swear to God that you didn't do it, uh, and you have maybe, uh, you know, in this case, it should be between 12 and 25 individuals, oath helpers who are prepared to uh, support your claim, you know, that you were doing something else at that time. Uh, 
From our modern day perspective, this might seem problematic. You have to imagine that people of status and wealth would find it easier to come up with a bunch of oath helpers. Uh, that's just kind of me giving you my opinion. Uh, it's not something I've investigated in great depth. Uh, another way of determining innocence or guilt was the ordeal. So it's kind of this idea that if you really were innocent, God would allow no harm to come to you. Right? So a very typical way of doing this is if you were accused of a crime, you might be called upon to stick your hand in the fire. The idea being that, well, if you're innocent, you, your hand won't burn. Uh, I think I know what you're thinking, and I probably agree with you, but that's what it was. Uh, and, so, and so those were two different, you know, kind of ways of trying to determine innocence or guilt that would actually influence developments during the Middle Ages in Europe. Finally, we'll kind of conclude this half of the lecture by a consideration of, you know, developments related to the evolution of the Catholic Church. Right, so we already saw with the Council of Nicaea, they're kind of determining what proper belief is, determining you know, which gospels should go into the Bible or what will become the official you know, kind of church-sanctioned Bible. Uh, but you know, development of the faith doesn't stop there. Right? Uh, there's going to be a lot of consideration about what does it mean to be a Christian? How do you live your life? And so we have a number of individuals early on that we often refer to collectively as the church fathers uh, because they, they really wrote a lot uh, about you know, certain issues pertaining to the good Christian life that would prove very influential. One of the most important is Augustine. Uh, you'll find many of these are referred to as saints because later on the church will what we call canonize them, declare them saints, holy people. So he was operating between 354 and 430. Uh, maybe the most prominent of, sometimes we say the Latin fathers, because kind of corresponding to you know, what was still the Roman period. He was born in North Africa. He had become a professor of rhetoric at Milan in 384. Uh, and I should note, he had a reputation for being something of a party animal. I mean, he liked to drink, to womanize, to carouse, and so forth. Uh, but two years after he became a professor, he had this very profound and moving religious experience uh, where, you know, he felt the call, as they sometimes say, uh, became a Christian, went back to North Africa, where he served as a bishop in the city of Hippo until his death in 430. Uh, and so he wrote a lot about, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? And there are two works for which he's probably most famous. One is The Confessions, A History of the Heart, which is basically about his experience of conversion, right? So, you know, kind of a very kind of personal take on what it means to be, to be a Christian, to become one. And secondly, The City of God. This one actually, in some ways, is more important because it's kind of working out the relationship between the church and government, effectively a Christian philosophy of government and history. So in the city of God, Augustine basically divided things into a city of God and a city of the world, right? Uh, the city of God represents the ideal, but the latter reflects more the reality and is necessary. Uh, you know, overlooking the city of God, of course, would be the church uh, representing God's will on earth. Overlooking the city uh, of the world would be the king. Uh, so we see kind of here the beginning of the separation between church and state, but we should be careful here. According to Augustine, uh, in essence, the, the state or the city of the world uh, should be serving the interests of the church. It was the duty of the king to create an environment that would be conducive to people being good Christians, right? That would curb the depraved instincts of sinful humans. And from Augustine's uh, point of view, this would become... Uh, a very common perspective in the Catholic Church, human beings are inherently sinful, right? If it wasn't for Jesus dying on the cross to absolve them of their sins, uh, they would all be condemned to hell, right? So humans are, you know, it's kind of understood that humans left to do, you know, to go their own way are probably always going to make the, the wrong choice. Uh, and so you need a king to try and kind of keep people on the straight and narrow. Well, having said that, right, a lot of what he wrote here would really kind of provide a justification for secular political authority and would become a basis for kings trying to assert their authority in some cases against the church. 
right? Um, you know, and mind you, he was writing this at a time when Roman authority was collapsing, right? So there was a lot of thought about, uh, you know, what's going to take its place and what would that look like and what would be the role of the church uh, in, in that regard. Well, we're going to talk about St. Augustine. We should also mention something else he's famous for. Um, you know, among the depravities he felt humans were guilty of, uh, many of them corresponded to sexual desire. Uh, so, you know, Augustine basically felt that sex is bad. That's it. End of story. Uh, as far as he's concerned, the ideal is that you should never engage in sex at all. In fact, uh, I mean, yes, you, you can do it within the, the boundaries of marriage, but even then he still considered it sinful. So you should only have sex uh, for the purpose of procreation. If you're enjoying it, you're doing something wrong. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, he had sowed his wild oats by this point. So uh, very nice of him to promote that idea, but, but it should be noted. I mean, this would actually become the prevailing view within the, the Catholic Church, right? That sex is something inherently bad. You really shouldn't be enjoying it. And you should only do it for the purpose of procreation and within the confines of marriage. Well, another very important church father was Jerome, uh, who was living between 345 and 420. Uh, so, you know, Roman culture, uh, Roman civilization in many ways still flourishing. And in fact, he pursued literary studies in Rome and became a master of Latin prose. Uh, but then he became a Christian and dedicated his life to Jesus. And he greatly valued what uh, Roman uh, civilization had to offer, Roman literature, Roman philosophy, and so forth, but he was concerned that much of it was pagan. And so he kind of devoted himself to purifying the literature of any kind of pagan elements to make sure that it would be compatible with the Christian faith. And finally, we should note that uh, maybe he is most famous for translating the Bible, uh, both the Old and New Testaments, into Latin, creating what's known as the Latin Vulgate or Common Text. This is the official Bible of the Catholic Church. Uh, up until then, uh, the Old Testament, what corresponded to the Jewish Bible, uh, its original language would have been Hebrew, but it would also have been, would also have been translated into Greek. Uh, and the primary language of the New Testament was Greek. Right? So this is, both of these are now translated into Latin, and this becomes effectively the official Bible, the standard edition of the Catholic Church. And so th this ends the first half of this lecture. Uh, please make sure to click on the link for the next half as soon as you can.